Also, a quick prayer. Father, we just thank you for the reminder of the power of what happened in that manger so many years ago. And we just ask for wisdom to reflect on that and to incorporate into our lives. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Did Mary know? And if she knew, would she have continued going through with it, knowing how her heart would be broken, knowing she'd one day be sitting at the bottom of a cross, looking up at her son dying for the the wrongdoing of all the world. How could she have fully comprehended how inconvenient her pregnancy would be, how inconvenient her life would be, how challenging her son's ultimate death would be? And in contrast to that, it's interesting because as inconvenient as life was for Jesus, as inconvenient as life was for Jesus, I still, every Christmas, live with the expectation that Christmas should not inconvenience me. Don't you? Christmas should be perfect. Everyone should get along. It should be magical. It should be wonderful. We even say stuff like that. Kids, can't you stop fighting? It's Christmas, right? You're inconveniencing me with your fights. My mother-in-law has inconvenienced me with the, the, the way she's requiring us to do X versus Y. My sister-in-law is forcing us to wear certain things I didn't want to wear for the family picture. And I start not only having this expectation, but maybe if you've got a problem like I do with impatience or anger, I get angry when Christmas inconveniences me. I get angry at the person that won't change the family pattern because we're trying to get to so-and-so's house and such-and-such house. The person who's really bossy, the person who forgets to say thank you, the person who's irritable or their kids are irritable, my kids. I'm like, it's Christmas, man. It's not supposed to inconvenience me or inconvenience my family. It's not supposed to be like this. And yet, why is it that I would think that my experience should be far different than the actual child and family who created the first Christmas. What kind of hubris hubris or, or ego or arrogance is in me that I think that I deserve better than the Son of God? There's an old Oak Ridge Boys song. I'm not a huge Oak Ridge Boys singer, but a, a, a singer or a listener for that matter. And uh, the song is called An Inconvenient Christmas. And I love these words. Among the bills that I received was a postcard marked Apology. The Christmas gifts you ordered aren't in stock. Oh, they're not in stock. That's so inconvenient. I'm so angry. So I packed up the kids for Grandpa's house. Then a blizzard blew in. The car broke down. So we shared a quart of eggnog at a truck stop, and I said, Kids, this is unfortunate. But you think this is bad? Well, it's inconvenient. But the most inconvenient Christmas ever was was the first one when God came so far to give himself for us. And if God would inconvenience himself to do what he did for us, why would we not want to do the same to others? In our series, Holiday Survival Guide, we've we've been talking about the difference between a to-do list. We all have to-do lists. But how do we create a to-be list? How can we be more joyful, be more compassionate, be more generous, be more servant and others-minded? And I want to suggest today that there's a shift possible that will help you survive the holidays. And the shift is to move from, how dare you inconvenience me? And even though you don't say it out loud, I have that voice in my heart. When somebody says something or doesn't do something or does something way different from me, In my heart, deep down, a quiet voice. It's a loud voice that I keep quiet. How dare this person, how dare this car, how dare this situation inconvenience me? But what if we were to make a shift from how dare you inconvenience me to how can I inconvenience myself for you? Hey, if that's your preference, how could I adapt to your preference? How could I adapt to what you need? How can I inconvenience myself to make this a better experience for you? And if I'm inconvenienced, it's a great chance to grow. It's a great chance to serve. It's a great chance for me to help you to whatever you're going through right now. Wouldn't it be different if we made that shift? But I think in order to make that shift that will bring more peace 
and joy and make us less irritable and less arrogant in our, uh, at least my, belief that I know better than everyone else how things should run, we're going to have to make a shift of our definition of joy. As Doug talked about last week, we think joy is being in convenience. The more in comfort, in convenience I am, the more joy I have. And we're going to have to do a paradigm shift. Joy is no longer being in convenience, but real joy, real life, real meaning, and real purpose is not being in convenience. It's being inconvenienced for others. That's where we find the real meaning of life and the real meaning of Christmas. I'll give you three principles that, that help us find that joy and help us find that peace. The first one is this. Christmas, if you read the story or the account, it's a customized time to be inconvenienced. Everything about how the history unfolded during that time, everything set up a customized time to be inconvenienced. Look what it says. And it came to pass in those days. In what days? In the days that Mary was pregnant. In those days that God would send his son, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. What a lousy time to need to go pay your taxes. What a lousy time to need to go take a trip. What a lousy time to leave your business. What a lousy time to have to travel a hundred miles from where you are to where you need to be when you're nine months pregnant. It's a customized historical event of inconvenience. And the writer tells us this census, by the way, hadn't happened before. It first took place while Quinius was governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, everyone to his own city. And history confirms this isn't just a fable. This isn't just a myth. This actually happened in human history. This idea of requiring people to go back to the family of their lineage because they were paying both property taxes as well as a population tax, was confirmed by the Egyptians as well. As late as 104 A.D., we found papyruses, because Egypt was also part of the Roman Empire, where they too were required to send their citizens back to their land to make sure they were properly accounting and getting more property tax. More property tax. It's Christmas. Travel. It's Christmas. Caesar Augustus, not the easiest guy to live under. It's Christmas. In fact, Josephus Flavius, who's a Jewish historian, as well as Tacitus, a Roman historian, both confirm what the Bible affirms here, that Quinius was in, was in ruling during this time, and they were requiring people to go to a certain place in a certain time. And if you're Joseph, you're just overcoming the idea that maybe because an angel confirmed it to you, your, your fiancé hasn't cheated on you, she has God's baby inside her, you're thinking, well, that was inconvenient. And now the looks you're getting from all the neighbors, well, that's inconvenient. And now, just as you're sort of settling with, well, I don't have to divorce her quietly, but at least we're going to have a life together, then you hear about in those days we suddenly have to go do this, oh, well, that's inconvenient. Christmas, with all the pressure and all the visiting and all the gifts and all the to-do lists we have, it's a customized time to be inconvenienced, which is either going to make us very irritable and angry, how dare this holiday inconvenience me, or we can embrace it. How can I be inconvenienced for others the same way Joseph and Mary and God was inconvenienced that first Christmas? One of the things we do at our church, we, we just love to serve people here, near, and far Last weekend, a group from our church went and they visited Happy Church. We send junior high trips down there and high school trips down there. It's uh, one of the poorest of poor areas in Appalachia. Many of the gifts, many of you bought gifts at our, our giving tree. And those gifts, I came in on Wednesday and saw a group of volunteers who were packing up those presents and taking them to inter-parish ministries as well as bringing gifts down to give to some of the poorest of poor. The population down that we work with in Happy Church is 40% of them on gov government subsidies. And are literally living hand to mouth. So a group of families from our church last weekend went down to serve uh, some families down there, deliver some gifts. And while they were there, they were given the opportunity to put in a hot water heater into a uh, single wide trailer, I believe. They had to be careful because they, they weighed enough that where they stepped could actually go through the floor. They got the hot water heater in, and though it would fit in the space where the hot, weeder, hot water heater belonged, it would not fit through the doorway, which was just a little bit narrower. So as one of our 
team members got in there with the hot water heater, he realized that if we could pry open just a little piece of the paneling, then we'd be able to get the hot water heater in for the family. So it's already pretty inconvenient, <laughs> traveling a couple hours down to Appalachia, giving up some vacation time, you bring your family with, very inconvenient to serve somebody else. Then it was sort of wedged in the middle of that space, take the crowbar, pry open the paneling. If I could just get another eighth of an inch, I think we can make this happen. And as you're sort of stuck in there between a wall and a hot water heater, and you pull it open, and all of a sudden he said, 500, maybe 1,000 cockroaches came out all over the wall, climbing up him into his hair. He's trying not to scream. He's trying not to yell, trying not to make an embarrassing moment. Not very convenient to serve others. Got the paneling off. Got the hot water heater in. I just need the two wing nuts to wire it all up. He just set them right there. Two of the kids of the family that he was helping, one of them had stolen the wing nuts. Went through the process of getting the wing nuts back, hoping this MacGyver uh, electrical system would work. Hooked it up. Sure enough, the hot water is working. Turns to the family on the way out. And they didn't even turn away from the television to say thanks. Now, that's not convenient. But that's when you know you're really serving, honestly. You're not just serving for the good feeling you get or for the accolades you get back. You're saying, I'm going to serve people who may not say thanks. I'm going to serve people who may not or may even feel entitled or maybe ungrateful. But I'm going to inconvenience myself for others because God inconvenienced himself for me when I wasn't grateful, when I felt entitled, when I didn't even thank him for my talents and my skills or what he did in human history. How often do you inconvenience yourself for others who don't do anything in return? That's why we work with inter-parish ministries. That's why we have giving trees. That's why we give here, near, and far. We want to serve those who are thankful and those who are unthankful. Those who believe the way we do and those who don't believe the way we do. We want to be lavishly generous and inconvenience ourselves for the sake of our community. Our second principle. Our second principle is that God's will is almost always found... When we're inconvenienced, strange as I look back in my life, God's will or the growth he does in my life almost always occurs during the time when I feel I'm most inconvenienced. And you certainly see that here in the passage as well. Joseph also went up to Galilee. He has to go out from Nazareth and Judea. He's got to go from the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. He's thinking, Bethlehem? Nothing good comes out of Bethlehem. Well, it's a podunk little place. Why in the world do I have to go to Bethlehem? This is not a good time in my business. Not a good time for taxation. Oh my goodness, I didn't put the margin in place for this extra tax. And I've got to go to Bethlehem. So he goes to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who, by the way, was with child. That's inconvenient. And while they were there, of all, she could have been three months pregnant. She could have been six months pregnant. She could have been one month pregnant. But no, look at the time words. While they were there... It happens to be the most inconvenient time because not only you're paying taxes, but she's about to give birth. How inconvenient. More than that, it's not just that she's pregnant. It's not just that she's nine months pregnant. It's that she can't find a place to stay. There's no room in the inn. And it happens at that moment that she goes into labor. And she brought forth her firstborn son, in the most inconvenient place, in the most inconvenient way, not laying home in your own bed, not with mom or dad there to help. No, it's just you and your husband and a bunch of animals. How smelly. How not how I pictured Christmas did the first Christmas seem. And she brought forth her firstborn son. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes and she laid him in a manger, a manger of all things, a place where you water animals. That's not the kind of children's room she might have imagined because there was no room for them in the end. And if I told you this was your story and you told me what's been going on this month or this year and you've had some good things that you could also list out a lot of inconvenient things, you might come to the conclusion because so-and-so is not talking to so-and-so because this deal didn't go through or that deal got pulled out from underneath me or you got some bad news from such and such. You would say, I am totally and completely out of God's will. God has left the building. Maybe he winds up the universe and doesn't get involved anymore. Whatever the reason, I know he's not working in my life, right? You would think the same thing here. This is the farthest place from God's work. 
This is the farthest place from God's will. And yet, we know this is the closest place to God's plan and the closest place to God's will. God's will and God's purpose unravels most, is revealed most when we are inconvenienced. The last seven years of my life, having adopted my son Quinn and gone through blindness and gone through autism and and literally remodeling my house monthly to keep him alive with locks and windows and gates and and it's on and on and on. I tell you the thing God has taught me the most. I have been saved and rescued from the delusion of a convenient and comfortable life. Prior to adopting my son, we had decided... We got a 10-year-old and 8-year-old. We are going to be empty nesters by 42. We're going to have a great second half. It's going to be long, long, long with lots of freedom. And there's nothing wrong with that. But God said, so your deciding joy is living in convenience. Will you inconvenience yourself to meet a young mother? Will you inconvenience yourself to walk with her during her pregnancy? Will you inconvenience yourself to take in a third child? Will you inconvenience yourself to find out that he has a disability? Will you daily inconvenience yourself and go through shoulder therapy and all the things that I can rescue you from the delusion of a comfortable life and teach you the real joy of being inconvenienced daily? I don't always love it. I don't always enjoy it. But I'm convinced God used it to rescue me from a convenient and comfortable life. You see, selfishness is that voice that says, I am not inconvenienced enough these days. Service is how can I be inconvenienced more for others. Have you heard the story this year of the uh, Seattle Seahawks quarterback, Russell Wilson? He got onto a plane with Alaska Airlines, and as he sat down, just thinking about all the things, all the freedoms he has, all the opportunities he had, all the finances he have, all the fame he has. He's sitting there just sort of enjoying the moment, and all of a sudden he sees a soldier come in and walk past him. Never seen the guy before, didn't know this particular guy. His name was Kane Burnus. As he walked past him, sitting in his first-class seat and watched this soldier who had possibly fought, endured, gone through boot camp, done whatever he had done. He just said, you know what? I want to make sure that somebody who's paid for me, somebody who's fought for me, doesn't have to sit back in economy. So he called the stewardess and he paid and he upgraded the soldier to first class. Now, at an NFL Salary, is that a big inconvenience? No. But how often do we miss the opportunities around us to serve others, to care for others, to inconvenience ourselves, to take notice of people who need to be helped, people who might need a smile, people who might need an extra hand, people who might need us to just show them that what they've done really matters. He ended up uh, getting on Twitter, the soldier did, sending out a tweet saying thank you to the quarterback, from the Seattle Seahawks, and it got ricocheted back to him, and he responded, it was my pleasure to give back to you in all the ways I don't even know that you've given to me. God's will is almost always found when we inconvenience ourselves for the sake of others. But the third principle, which I think is the most profound and strikes my heart, is that the more somebody inconveniences themselves for you, the more you want to inconvenience yourself for them. Do you remember your first boss who gave you your first big break? And you had a pretty good resume, but still you needed a break. And they took a risk on you. And you still remember that boss because you remember that they inconvenienced their schedule because they had to give you a little bit more training than, than, maybe, than maybe you thought you needed because you thought you were all ready to go. You remember them taking a risk. Or you remember a boss or maybe a colleague who took a little more blame on a project that you probably deserved. And they inconvenienced themselves to take on responsibility for things that you were more to blame for. They gave you maybe more credit than you deserved. And when they did that, how did you feel toward that boss, toward that company? You said, I want to work harder for this company. I want to do my best here. When somebody inconveniences themselves for you, you want to go and serve and inconvenience yourself for them. You want to do unto others as it's been done unto you, right? 
And that's what the message of Christmas is about. As the shepherds come and they hear the message of what God's doing, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that the angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord is shown around them. And the angel said to them, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. There's angels all over that place are crying out loud. Do not be afraid. I'm bringing you good tidings of great joy. It's going to be for all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, that podunk little place that didn't think anything good could happen in, this random, seemingly random location that I brought you to for, a, for paying your taxes, in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Let me start with the word Lord there. The word Lord is literally the word God. God himself, the Christ. Christ means anointed one. Some people think Jesus Christ, that Christ is his last name. Not so much, even though you may have heard it that way. Christ is actually a title. Jesus, the Messiah, the sent one, the anointed one, is the Lord, God himself. God is coming to you at Bethlehem, and this will be the sign. This is how you'll know it's God. Now, if you're writing this, what would you put down? You'll know it's God because of the flaming sword. You know it's God because of the flaming bush. You know it's God because of the big sparkly people glowing there. Right? I mean, that, that's how you assign you know it's God. He says, here's how you'll know it's God. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. The multidimensional, beyond time and space God, the omnipresent can be all places at all time God, will squish himself and humble himself into one place. This multidimensional being will be in one dimension. And in that transformation, he will inconvenience himself, leaving the penthouse of heaven to come to the literal outhouse of earth. And in this place, he will allow himself to be dependent on human beings. He will allow himself to be ultimately betrayed, denied, scourged, and crucified. He will live an incredibly inconvenient life in contrast to the convenience of heaven. Because he wants you to know how much he loves you, cares for you, and wants friendship with you. And as you see how much the Lord inconvenienced himself to become a babe, he wants you to say and feel, if somebody would inconvenience himself like that for me, I want to go and do the same for others. I want to adapt to others. I want to inconvenience myself for others. I want to serve others. I want to forgive others. I'm willing to suffer for others. I'm willing to endure for others if it's true that he did that for me. God came down to our level so we could know him. I'm a sci-fi fan, so I was watching uh, or listening to a sort of geeky uh, podcast about Adam Nimoy. That's Leonard Nimoy, Spock's son. They said, hey, your dad passed away this year. Tell us a little bit about your relationship with your dad. He says, oh, my dad, I, I respected my dad. I love my dad. My dad, you know, name, he's in movies, he was in TV shows. He was the mighty Spock. I would go to the movies with him. He said, my dad, actually, Leonard Nimoy, was a lot like the character he played. He was pretty stoic. Though he was famous and always very approachable to the fans, I didn't feel like I ever really knew my dad. Just because he was just sort of pretty closed off and pretty stoic. Loved him, cared for him, loved the fact that he was famous. He said, a couple of years into my, into my adult life, I got into drugs and I got into alcohol and just was heading toward a crash course in my life. And during that time, I found AA. It was during AA I found that I needed a higher power than myself, and I began to reach out to that, and I began to get honest about things I'd done and things I needed to make reconciliation with. And a few years into that... It came out that my dad also had an alcohol problem. And my dad also put himself in AA. And for the first time, my dad and I began to talk at a level we never had before. I still loved and respected my dad, but now I knew what he struggled with. And I would share the temptations I had, and he would share the temptations he had. And, and that was such a rich time in our life. Because now I knew my father not just as the mighty Spock live long and prosper, but I knew my dad as somebody who could empathize with me. 
And though God didn't come to earth to engage in wrongdoing, He did come down from the God of the lights, the God of the universe. He came down to our level. So the Bible says that He could empathize with us. He came down into the gutter with us. He came down into the earth with us. He came down so He can say, I know what it's like to lose somebody. I lost my cousin John the Baptist in a tragic accident. Have you lost your son? God says, I lost my son on the cross. I can empathize with you. Have you had somebody stab you in the back this year? I know what that's like. Let me tell you about my friend Peter. You know how hard it is to forgive somebody who did that to you? I do. And I forgave Peter for what he did for me. God, do you know what it's like to live in a world with sickness and pain? And I do. I do. And it's hard. And I want to be here with you. See, the reason God came down to our level, the reason He inconvenienced Himself for us is so that we could know Him, not just as an equation, not just as the guy who wound up the universe, not just as the person who made the stars, but to know Him as an intimate friend. That's why God came about us. And that's why we can make this shift from how dare you inconvenience me to in light of what God's done for me, How can I inconvenience myself for others the way God inconvenienced himself for me? So how do we do that? This Christmas season, as you're going to be around all kinds of commotion and all kinds of chaos and all kinds of expectations and all kinds of different personalities and all kinds of people who are under stress, I want to challenge you during this time to listen for that voice, how dare you, and switch it to how can I inconvenience myself. Four ways, four T's I want to encourage you with. And you pick one, maybe pick two. How can we inconvenience ourselves for others? Number one, try it. Just try it. To have the mindset to say, I'm going to try when so-and-so says such-and-such and and I always get irritated. I'm going to, number one, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try holding my temper. I'm not going to do anything nice yet. That's too much. I'm just going to not do something bad. I'm going to try it. Or what if when somebody does something irritating, you say to yourself, I'm going to assume the best. I'm going to assume that something happened before they came in the room. Something happened this week, this month, this year. They're lonely. They're hurt. They're depressed. They just got laid off. I'm going to assume there's some reason why they're this irritable. Try it. This year, try serving. Maybe it's going and getting something from our giving tree. Maybe it's serving in our children's ministry this coming year. Maybe it's this year you're going to try it. You're going to... Go down to Happy Church on one of our on one of our trips. Try it. Maybe if you've never given financially, you've been growing here at Horizon for a while, and you say, "I've never really given money to the church because I thought the church is all about money. This church doesn't even ask for money. Does that mean you don't need money? Of course we do. And maybe for the first time, you want to say, "God, I don't feel guilted into something. I just want to try. It. I want to try giving to you and to your work as a way of saying I want to grow. Try it." Some of you say, I've tried it. Maybe you need to move to the next step. And that's, I want to tip it. I want to tip it. The difference between trying something is you do it once. A tip is a pattern, right? Every time you go to a restaurant, you tip. You know, based on the experience, you respond to that experience. And maybe you want to move from just trying it once to this year, the idea of service and gratitude and, and generosity. You want to move into a pattern. It might be a small pattern, situationally based, but you want to tip it. How can I, in this circumstance, make a pattern? My tendency is to be impatient. And when I'm around this person, God, I want to ask that I can make a pattern of being patient. I have a tendency to be judgmental. My first reaction is to judge them. God, I want to tip toward, lean toward being compassionate and toward empathy here. God, I want to remind myself, before I walk in the room, I'm the waiter there to serve them. People aren't here to serve me. I want to put myself into the tipping mindset of I'm here to tip my heart toward patience, tip my heart toward complimenting somebody. And now I've gone from not just being irritated by the person, not just holding my tongue, but when I get irritated, I'm going to tip toward them and say, man, I'm so glad you're here. Well, you know, is there anything I can get for you? Instead of just being neutral, you're not going to lean in their direction. You're going to tip in their direction. If it's, it's financially for you. Instead of just trying one time to give some money away, to become a pattern. It may not be a percentage of your income at all, but just make a pattern. I'm going to regularly give in a certain way financially. Or I'm going to regularly serve every week, every month. I'm going to go work with City Gospel Mission. I'm going to create a pattern. Just a tip. Just a tip my heart towards serving other people. Just 
especially people who I don't get any accolades for. There's no personal benefit to me for doing it. And you watch what happens to your heart when you serve people who are entitled. You'll immediately get angry and judgmental and you'll say, wow, am I here to serve them or only if I get something in return? Wow, I need to grow my heart. Third step is to tithe it. God came up with this interesting system where he asked you to not just tip or try, but to give away a percentage of your time, to give away a percentage of your money. And why would he do that? Why not just set up dues? You know, here's the dues you know, to go to church or here's the dues to be in my kingdom. I think the reason he set up a percentage-based system, one is because it would be noticeable. It's a percentage of my time. It's a percentage of my money. It would be significant that way. And here's the key to that. When you give away a percentage of your time or a percentage of your money, it's a percentage of X. And when you move from tipping to tithing, here's what happens. Every time you write a check, if it's 1% of your income or 5% of your income, or maybe you're retired, you've decided to give one day out of your week, one out of seven to rest, or two out of seven to volunteering. Here's what happens. Every time you write that check, every time you go out act in service, you think this is 10% of X. And you're reminded how God has given you so much X, so much money, so much freedom, so much opportunity. And that percentage reminds you of how much God's given you. And that is why it grows your heart. It's not like God needs stuff from you. He wants something not from you, but for you. So maybe for you, it's making a deliberate decision this year that you're going to give away a percentage of your income. Maybe it's giving away a percentage of your time. It's beyond just a tipping pattern. You want to make it a part that reminds you how much God's entrusted to you. I remember my dad, every time we would go for Thanksgiving or Christmas, we'd show up for our Christmas holiday. My dad was a school teacher, and we'd show up to Grandma Eltrevogue's, and, and he would always, as he showed up, we'd, we'd open gifts, and then for the next week while he was there, he would remodel her whatever, her bathroom, remodel her kitchen, remodel whatever it was for free. And one day, I remember I was probably, I don't know, junior high or high school, he says, Chad, will you come help me? And in my arrogant, self-centered, eighth-grade version of myself, I walked in, and as Dad said, could you, could you work alongside me as we, we model the kitchen and the bathroom here for Grandma Eltrevogue? I remember saying out loud these words. Dad, it's called Christmas vacation, not Christmas work week. I remember my dad just going, all right, you can go outside. As my dad generously gave of his short amount of, of uh, time during the holidays to serve and give others. And sometimes in the same way as a child, you don't really understand that that really is a life of meaning and purpose. The same thing spiritually. As you grow spiritually, the more and more you realize that inconvenient is a way of life. And the last T is to test it. You know, the one thing that God says we can test him in is our generosity. He says, test me in this. If you start giving away large portions of your life and your finances, test me in this and see if I will not open the, the gates of heaven and come down upon you. See if I will not bless you in ways that you wouldn't have gotten any other way. Test him. Test him. Actually, instead of just holding your temper towards somebody you're mad at, instead of just giving them, paying them a compliment, what if you really, what if you really prayed for those who are your enemies? God says, test me in this. That person you hate, that person you can't forgive, start praying my blessing upon them and watch what happens in your heart. Test me. Test me. I want you to give a gift to somebody who irritates you. And watch what happens to your heart. Watch how it unlocks bitterness in your heart. Try it. Test me in this. Test me in this and see if giving away large percentages of your income to my work, to my priorities, does it transform your heart in ways that accumulation doesn't? Try me. Love your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. Serve those who feel that they're entitled. Buy a gift for somebody you're irritated at. Forgive the unforgivable. And watch what I will do as you give your life away. Seven years ago, like I said, we, we adopted my son and the gavel came down and he was adopted and in our family. And I thought at that moment, wow, we've been inconvenienced, but what a joy. Having a third child. Then six months later, we'd find out he's blind and our whole world would begin to unravel as we began to see that our next 20 years would be very different than what we thought. And I thought, God, wow. And I grew my faith in a way that nothing else could have. Then six months later, we'd find out he has autism, and it was pretty severe. And seven years into this, it's pretty severe. 
He's still in the less than 1% uh, communication. He's a joy in our life. He brings more laughter into our life, more innocence in our life. But our life has been radically changed the last seven years. Two years ago, I remember we've been staying in contact with his birth mother because there's an open adoption. And she called my wife up and said, I'm in real trouble. I'm in a domestic violence situation. Can you guys help? And my wife turns to me and says, can we help? I'm like, no. I said, Seriously, I think we've done enough. That's a terrible thing to say, but I mean, you can only go so far. She's like, no, I think God wants us to do this. That does sound like the kind of thing God wants to do, to be even more inconvenienced. So we did. Around the holiday season, we, we worked through a whole circumstance to get her rescued out of that situation. We brought her home, and we're trying to find a place for her to stay. And, and Beth's like, well, it's going to be a couple days before we can find a place for her. Do you think she could stay with us? And I think we've done enough. It's only a couple of days. She has a child and she's pregnant. Quinn does not do well with other kids. It's going to be utter chaos. Yeah, well, I think we should do it. That does sound like the kind of thing God wants to do. And so she stayed with us for a couple of days and it was as disastrous as you can imagine. And we set up places to stay and tried to keep Quinn on one side of the house and child on the other side of the house. And, and we tried to just find joy in the midst of it. It was the most chaotic holiday I can remember. And we invited her to one of our services. And we had you know, do eight Christmas Eve services. She sat right over here in this section. And, you know, I'm preparing for speak six times that weekend. I'm thinking the last thing I need is to sleep for two hours the day before. And after that service, she came and said, I want to know a God who would forgive and love and serve like you described. Not because I gave a great message, I don't think. I don't think it was that great. But because she saw us acting it out the days before. Never have I been so stretched. I don't remember what else happened that holiday season. But I do remember this. By God inconveniencing more than I ever imagined, he grew me and my faith toward him. In such a deep way that still sits with me this many years later. I want to invite the band to come out as they do. I just want to encourage you. Try it. Try being a servant. Try giving more than you've ever given before. Try giving patience and compassion and love in a way you've never tried before. Tip it. Make a pattern out of it in your life. More than that, tithe it. Look at a percentage system of giving your time and your, and your treasure away. Because what happens, it reminds you how much God's given you. And lastly, test God in this. Say, God, I want to test out this whole thing. Will really loving my enemy change my heart so I'm not so angry all the time? I want to test you in this. And then you find the real meaning of Christmas. Tommy Smothers used to say, if you still listen to Smothers Brothers, he says, it's better to have gifts than receipts. (laughs) And I think my heart operates often like it's better to have gifts than receipts. But when you learn to give your life away, you find that it truly is better to give than to receive. Thank you, guys. Well, that is the meaning of Christmas. That is the meaning of Christmas. It's uh, joy, it's generosity, it's sacrifice, it's caring and loving on others. Go and inconvenience yourself for the next week and a half for other people. If you want to join us for our Christmas Eve service, we'd love for that to be a gift to you as well. Uh, If you came prepared to give financially, so some offering box on the way out. You do need tickets for our eight Christmas Eve services. They're complimentary, but we do want to make sure everyone has a seat. So head your way out to the uh, fireplace, grab some tickets, and we will see you on Saturday for eight Christmas Eve services. See you in the next year after that.